you everybody and uh delighted to see my good friend uh jeff perry back uh here i have um a couple of words that i would like to read about him i can say much more but i had planned this introduction so please uh indulge me i would just like to say that i think i met jeff at the beginning of his uh long journey as a independent working class scholar actually jeff was part of a program that i supervised many years ago in newark new jersey that's where we initially met so having said all that let me just read to you formally about dr jeffrey b perry who is an independent working class scholar formally educated at princeton Harvard, Rutgers, and Columbia Universities. The recently published second volume of his Hubert Harrison biography entitled Hubert Harrison, The Struggle for Equality, 1918 to 1927, uh, and that is at Columbia University Press, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Dr. Perry's work focuses on the central role of white supremacy as a retardant to progressive social change and on the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy to progressive social change efforts. For 50 years, Jeff Perry has been active in the working class movement as a rank and file worker and as a union shop steward, officer, editor, editor and retiree. He has also been involved in domestic and international social justice issues, including affirmative action, tenants' rights, union democracy, anti-apartheid, anti-war, and anti-imperialistic war. Jeffrey Perry was influenced um, uh, toward serious study in the matter of class and the importance of opposition to white supremacy through personal experiences and readings, and through the work of an independent, autodidactic working class scholar and close personal friend, the late Theodore William Allen. Allen pioneered his class struggle-based white skin privilege analysis in 1965 and was the author of The Invention of the White Race. We will have the opportunity to hear Dr. Perry at a later date to discuss the work of Theodore W. Allen. Theodore Allen's research and writing on the role of white supremacy in the United States history and on the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy to social change efforts disposed Perry to be receptive to the life and work of Hubert H. Harrison, another independent autodidactic, anti-white supremacist, working class intellectual. Perry considers Harrison and Allen to be two of the 20th century's most important thinkers and writers on race and class in America. There are a few more things I can say about this incredible man, but let me just say uh, just th uh, these few things. Uh, Dr. Perry, an archivist, a bibliophile, a historian has preserved an inventory the Hubert Harrison papers and helped place them in the rare book manuscript library at Columbia University. And to develop the Hubert Harrison papers, uh, finding aid, these contribute to making the writings of Hubert Harrison freely accessible on a worldwide basis. The Hubert Harrison papers digital collection at Columbia University rare book and manuscript library websites attest to them. He is also the editor of a Hubert Harrison reader. Uh, Dr. Perry has been nominated for numerous awards for his work here and abroad, but they're too numerous for us to mention here. You are invited to read more about him on his website, www.jeffreybperry.net. Finally, I would like to say that it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome my old friend, Jeffrey Perry, back to the mic to pass it along this information. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you very much, Muriel. 
um, so much. And it's so great to be doing this with you. And Tati, thanks for helping with this. And I'll just note that one of the videos that Muriel and I did about eight years or so ago just passed 168,000 views on YouTube. It was on Alan's work that we did that down at the old Brett Forum. But Muriel really was my tutor in the early years and kind of gave me some direction and guidance. But um, I just want to begin opening with 10 slides and then we're going to figure out how we get into the real meat of this. And it's going to be, repeat a little what Muriel said, but you'll be able to see it also. You can hear it and then you can see it. So uh, Tati, can you go to those slides? Sure. Or should I do it? How do I how do, we do this? No, 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 I can do it. Smart from the first and it's only 10. Next one. Next. Okay. Hubert Harrison lived from 1883 to 1927. He was a brilliant intellectual writer, speaker, reviewer, and activist, race and class conscious radical internationalist. He's known as the father of Harlem radicalism. He's a key ideological link in the civil rights slash black liberation movement and he will continue to grow in importance in the 21st century. Next slide. That's my webpage, very easy to find. All kinds of free audio, video, and print materials. Please, it's easy to remember my name, but take advantage of it, go there, and go up and down the columns. You'll, you'll find much of interest. Next slide. Volume one of Hubert Harrison's biography was completed in 2008 and it's entitled Hubert Harrison, The Voice of Harlem Radicalism, 1883 to 1918. It was nominated for the Isaac Deutscher Award and uh, it's made a significant impact already. And if you go to the webpage on that book and you read some of the reviewers comments from activists and scholars, I think you'll just shake your head in amazement. I mean. It, so much laudatory praise for Harrison. Next um, slide. This is the volume I recently completed, Hubert Harrison, The Struggle for Equality, 1918 to 27, also for Columbia. And this volume was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Need I say I didn't win, but it was nominated. <laughs> Next slide. Another major book I wrote was a Hubert Harrison reader. Uh, it's 138 of, uh, one second. It has 138 of 700 articles by Harrison, introduction and notes, and it was published by Wesleyan University Press. And they just recently, after many years, put it out in ebook form. And I know there are a number of people who now prefer ebook to print books. So that I was very pleased that they did that. Next slide. Bringing it to Brooklyn. This is another book I did. Uh, this was a reprint with, with new introductions by me and very copious and detailed notes of Harrison's book, When Africa Awakes, subtitled The Inside Story of the stirrings and strivings of the new Negro in the Western world. It was printed in originally in 1920, in 1920, five years before Alain Locke wrote The New Negro. So Harrison is really, as you'll see as we talk, the pioneer of the new Negro, the militant new Negro movement. And Harrison's movement was both political and literary. Um, one other thing, Diasporic Africa Press is located in Brooklyn, and I was very pleased when they expressed an interest in it, some African scholars who wanted to get this out. And you'll see the little flag there, which will appear again later, black, brown, and yellow. And what's interesting about that is that was the tricolor flag that Harrison had for his Liberty, uh, his Liberty uh, League and later uh, for his International Colored Unity League. Next slide. There are the two volumes together, right? And just a few blurbs, we can skip them for now. You can look at them later when this is online. And uh, I think I have three slides more. Okay, this two volume biography on Harrison 
is based on more than 39 years of research and extensive use of the Harrison papers and diary, which I placed, I preserved an inventory before placing with Columbia University's rare book and manuscript library. It is believed to be the first full life multi-volume biography of an Afro-Caribbean and only the fourth of an African-American after those of Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Langston Hughes. Harrison is a giant of Black and Afro-Caribbean history. Next slide. Uh, Harrison, born in St. Croix, 1883, dies 1927, Bellevue Hospital. He was a brilliant autodidactic, working class, racing class, conscious writer, orator, editor, educator, book reviewer, political activist, and radical internationalist. Historian Joel A. Rogers in World's Great Men of Color described him as perhaps the foremost Afri Afro-American intellect of his time. The labor and civil rights activist A. Philip Randolph described him as the father of Harlem radicalism. Richard B. Moore, a major activist and bibliophile who worked with the Socialists, the African Blood Brotherhood, the Communist Party, movements for Caribbean independence, and for many years had a 125th Street in Harlem bookstore, described him as above all his contemporaries in his steady emphasis that a vital aim was the liberation of the oppressed African and other colonial people. And I just want to say one more thing. Richard B. Moore's daughter, Joyce Moore Turner, is still alive. She's over 100. She's about a hundred and a third now. And back in uh, some months ago, a few months ago, she actually had another journal published in a peer review publication. I think it was Journal of Caribbean History. She's 100 years old. She's still active. She's still writing. And she's very sharp. And she's one of the people I go to when I have serious questions, because I know I'll get a knowledgeable and straightforward response from her. So Joyce Moore Turner also, I'd like to just call attention to her. Next. Ha okay, Harrison played unique signal roles in the largest class radical movement, socialism, and the largest race radical movement, the new Negro slash Garvey movement of his era. He was a major influence on the class radical Randolph, the race radical Garvey, and other militant new Negroes and common people. That's a phrase he used with much affection in the period around World War I. W.A. Domingo, a socialist and the first editor of the Negro World, Garvey's newspaper, explained that Garvey, like the rest of us, and implicit in the rest of us was Randolph, Moore, Grace Campbell, Chandler Owens, Cyril Briggs, and other militant New Negroes followed Hubert Harrison. The historian and Garvey expert Robert A. Hill refers to Harrison as the New Negro ideological mentor. That might be the last slide in this grouping. I'm not sure, is it? Okay, now, how do I get to, so I can read my um, PowerPoint slides? Sorry, I was muted. Why don't you go to your PowerPoint? And even if we can't, uh, even if you can't see us, we can hear you. Can I downside? Can, can I downside? Yeah. And we can see if you can see where it goes to when you do that. Yeah. And okay. we, we can still see you even if you can't see us. Okay, good. But now, how do I get myself off my screen so I can get the other thing on screen? You can minimize the screen if you'd like and just open yeah, your. Yeah, and PowerPoint. where is that? That's up in view. Uh, no, that is up on the upper right hand corner. There is a line, a little line thing for you to minimize. Speaker, galley, exit full screen. Yeah. Does that makes sense? Yeah, sure. Okay. And let me see. You move around. If you can find your other PowerPoint. So I you hope can I just didn't lose you. Yay. Yay. Uh, one second. Uh, PowerPoint. Okay, here is my Zoom. We we can't. Uh, we just. Why don't you just open your PowerPoint and uh, tell us about it and read about it. Okay, we can okay. still see you and hear you, even if uh, you can't see us and hear. I can't us. see you, but if you can. We can hear good. you and see you. Okay, so. I'm, I'm talking loud enough. Okay, I'm going to go through some high points of Harrison's life, 
from the early period first, because sometimes, oftentimes when I do these talks, people are not familiar with them. And then I want to get into volume two, which is that new volume, which Muriel highlighted in her promo. Um, so Hubert Harrison was a brilliant intellectual. That's what J.A. Rogers said in World's Great Men of Color. And Harrison, when he came, after he came to the US, one of the headlines in one of the New York papers, the New York World said, genius found in West Indian student. They hadn't quite seen anybody like him because he was getting citywide honors in a couple of subjects. He spoke or read six languages to varying degrees, but he's self-educated and he never finishes high school. He read voraciously. One of the librarians up at the Schomburg Center years later said she knew nobody who took more books out of the Schomburg Center and read them than Hubert Harrison. He was an orator, a pioneering soapbox orator on history, science, politics, religion, education, literature, theater, evolution, race, and class. He was also uh, a prolific writer. I've, I, I've located 600 to 700 of his uh, writings, many of which are in the uh, archives at Columbia, but I still have much more to place. Um, his two books were The Negro and the Nation in 1917 and When Africa Awakes, which I showed you earlier, which was in 1920. He was also an editor of some important journals, including the left-wing publication, The Masses in 1911 his own paper, The Voice from 1917 to 1919, his own publication, The New Negro in 1919, note, note these years, 1919, The New Negro, six years before Alain Locke. Then he became editor of The Negro World, principal editor of The Negro World, which was Garvey's paper. And finally, in his last year, he was editor of The Voice of the Negro, which was the organ of uh, his last organization, the International Colored Unity League. Harrison was um, also a one extraordinary critic, a book critic, and uh, uh, both a literary critic and a critic of the theater. And he re received extraordinary praise from various people, including Eugene O'Neill, after he did a, a review of the Emperor Jones. Um, his book reviews, uh, Harrison was the first regular book reviewer. The phrase that's used is in Negro newspaper. He was writing regular book reviews in his papers and most importantly in the Negro world. So he's a pioneer book reviewer. He's a pioneer black activist in the socialist movement. As I said, he was the leading black activist. A pioneer black activist in the free thought movement, in the birth control movement, in the New Negro Movement. He was a promoter and aide to black writers and artists. He was a featured lecturer for the New York City Board of Education. And I believe he was the first regular uh, lecturer for the New York City Board of Education from 22 to 26. And for the teachers in the audience and for those who wanna dig a little deeper into New York City education history, there's much uh, to draw from, from Harrison's lectures and his work. And he was a bibliophile and libra uh, library popularizer. Um, and he was one of the founding offers, officers on the committee, which grew into uh, what became the Schomburg Center on 135th Street in New York. As I said earlier, Randolph called him the father of Harlem radicalism. Um, he was, as a class radical, he was the foremost black organizer, agitator, and theoretician socialist party during its 1912 heyday. As a race radical, he founded the first organization, Liberty League, and the first newspaper, The Voice, a newspaper for the New Negro of the New Negro Movement. And he was the editor of the, New ne of the Negro World, the principal radical influence on the Garvey movement during its 1920 high point. Harrison profoundly influenced a generation of new Negro militants and common people. He was the most, um, in his generation, he was the most class conscious of the race radicals and the most race conscious okay. of the class radicals. And he was a major radical influence on A. Philip Randolph, a class radical, and on Marcus Garvey, a race radical. Garvey, in fact, joined Harrison's organization and for those familiar with Garvey, he's not one to join anyone else's organization. 
Um, so once again, in terms of Harrison's relation to the new Negro movement, 1917 founds the Liberty League and the Voice, 1919 edits the new Negro, 1920 writes When Africa Week Awakes the Inside Story, Stirrings and Strivings of the New Negro, and 1925 Alain Locke edits the New Negro. So he's way ahead of him. And Harrison's work is much more political than Locke's. Um, now, again, when I say Harrison's the major class and race radical, he's also the lines of dissent. He influences Randolph and, Gar and Garvey, but those lines of dissent extend down. So I argue that he's a key ideological link in the two wings of the civil rights black liberation struggle, those represented by Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. It was Randolph who marched on Washington. Uh, it was King who marched on Washington with Randolph at his side. And uh, Malcolm's father was a Garveyite preacher and his mother was an editor for the same paper, uh, was a writer for the same paper that Harrison was an editor for, The Negro World. Harrison was also a radical internationalist and he was extremely knowledgeable on Africa, Asia, the Mideast, the Americas, and Europe. Richard B. Moore um, said he was above all the militant black so socialists in his steady emphasis on the uh, liberation of the oppressed African and colonial peoples. Historian Win Winston James said Harrison had confidence in and humility before the peoples and cultures of Africa. His knowledge was encyclopedic. He proudly identified with the African continuities in St. Croix and he was, and for Harrison, Africa was primarily a teacher, not a primitive unschooled child in need of civilization. And that last quote is interesting and deep because when Garvey's founding his UNIA, one of his objectives was to civilize the African people. That's a whole story I go into into the bio, but Harrison was, had much more humility in terms of his relations with other people. And Harrison wrote, Harrison himself wrote the following, which is very deep. Uh, Although I am not satisfied with American conditions as they are now, I realize that in these days of change and unrest, I would not have been satisfied anywhere else. In China, I would be fighting against foreign domination. In Egypt, India, South Africa, or West Africa, I would be fighting against the British oligarchs. In Jamaica, against the sinister repression of black people practiced by both whites and mulattoes. And in Dutch, French, or American West Indies against crackerism, stupidity, or cowardice. Um, now, I just want to outline briefly before we get into specifics of Harrison's life. Harrison's approach in general, and this is important for people to understand him, he was race conscious, he was class conscious, he was scientific, he was internationalist, he emphasized the common people. He had a mass approach back in his day, this is pre-TV and radio was only in its infancy. And I'll mention later how Harrison did some of the first black T uh, radio shows, but his mass approach entailed primarily soapbox oratory. He was a pioneer in that all over the city and around different parts of the country and in newspapers. He was a brilliant editor and writer. So that was how he reached the masses. He was a big proponent of direct action and he was proactive. He didn't wait around for things to happen. He understood <coughs> the interrelation between literature and the arts and he had wonderful relations with many of the prominent artists of his day. And hopefully we'll talk about that a little later. He was anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist and scientific. And throughout everything, as his children emphasized to me when they were still alive, he challenged white supremacy. He understood it was central to capitalist rule in the US. Um, now Harrison was unremembered also for, you know, he died in 1927. And when I started working on him and when I came out with the first volume, if I Googled his name, they were using a slightly different algorithm, but I came up with 800 hits. 
if I Googled Marcus Garvey, I came up with almost 800,000. That's like a thousand to one. And Du Bois was over a thousand to one in Booker T. So he was relatively unknown. And the reasons that Harrison's relatively unknown are he was poor, he was working class, he was black, he was foreign born. And when I say black, he was black. He was very black though. He, he considered that a factor. Uh, he was foreign born, he was from the Caribbean. If he were a woman, I would add that category. But also he was radical on class, race and religion. He was a forthright critic. He would speak his mind openly. This is something he learned early in his intellectual development. He had no long lasting organizational ties to keep his memory alive. He dies young and he's not martyred like Malcolm and Martin. And finally, the last reason I think is very important for understanding why he's not better known is how history is written and reviewed. And we can talk about that later because I have some very profound examples of that. Um, just going on with Harrison as a, someone who spoke out openly, he challenged uh, African-American left labor and literary figures and organizations of his era, including Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, Chandler Owen, uh, uh, left labor and literary figures, including Mary White Ovington, Oswald Garrison V. Yard, Kate Richards O'Hare, Joel Spingarn, Samuel Gompers, William Z. Foster and Carl Van Vechten, and organizations such as the AFL, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the Urban League, the NAACP, the American, um, uh, the Amsterdam News, the New Review, etc. He, he would speak openly and criticize all these groups. Now, if you're still with me, I can't see you, but we move into Harrison's roots. And these are important because they're important for understanding him and his radical and the nature of radicalism in this country also. He's born in St. Croix in the Danish West Indies, very briefly, uh, a Danish possession, spoke English in that island, uh, a capitalist agriculture, a colony of Denmark, many African customs were maintained. The color line and social control was unlike that in the US. And the reasons have to do with how social control was maintained. I'll speak about that more in a second. It also had a rich history of direct action mass struggle and Harrison's life and immigrants experience began to take on importance on the island. His mother was an immigrant from Barbados. His father had been born enslaved in St. Croix. When I say the color line was drawn differently in St. Croix, there was a policy of promotion, not strict uh, proscription for a significant sector of the African descended population. The reason for this has to do with the following. In St. Croix, 5% of the population was European. 80% of the population was black, primarily plantation workers. And 15% of the population was colored of mixed European and African ancestry. The greatly outnumbered European ruling elite for social control reasons implemented a policy of promotion of a sector of the African uh, descended population. So that manifested itself. That, sorry. That manifested itself in, um, uh, my doctor's calling. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. No formal segregation on the island no history of lynch terror, and white supremacy was not as virulent or as organized as in the US. Um, some of the examples of this were in St. Croix, there was, uh, in, in the US, the slave patrols were lily white. In uh, St. Croix, uh, there was a militia, but mul mulattoes played an a, a important role in the militia to maintain social control. In 1834, St. Croix passed an edict of full equality, 1834. And uh, in the US into the 1850s, we had the Dred Scott decision uh, that no black person has any rights that a, blown, uh, that a, uh, a white is bound to uh, respect. Moving on, 
So Harrison was born on an estate owned by two men of color. Again, highly unusual. On the island, um, amongst the direct action uh, items that I like to uh, cite is that they had an 1848 emancipation victory led by Budo, who I throw up a picture of. He was the uh, person who was alleged to be the leader of the emancipation victory. They had island-wide great fire burns, struggles on many of the plantations led by Queen Mary Thomas, followed in by a general strike in 1879. And there are many other little influences on Saint, from St. Croix, which I go into in great detail in Harrison's biography. But in 1899, his mother died and he goes to New York as a 17, he gets to New York in New York in 1900 as a 17 year old or orphan. And in arriving in New York, he follows his sister, Mary, who preceded him. And I point out that this pattern was a very common one, where sometimes the female would pave the way for other members of the family who would later follow. And that was the case in Harrison's family. When Harrison arrives in New York in 1900s, it was short, uh, shortly after a race riot, the fourth great race riot in New York City history. He had never seen anything like this. He, um, and he writes about that early. Uh, he um, lives in the West 60s with his sister at first. The West 60s were considered to have the meanest tenements in Manhattan, although the tenement uh, uh, museum online still doesn't focus on the West 60s. It does uh, other stuff. And um, he lived on West 62nd Street. Uh, Thelonious Monk rose up a decade or so later on West 63rd. And I oftentimes show uh, pictures of the building back then and later on, you know, when I visited it in the 80s. The year that Harrison arrived, for, uh, there were a total of 107, at least 107 African Americans lynched in the US. And I have a picture I usually show of four lynched at one time. And again, this was something unknown to Harrison down in St. Croix. Harrison's friend, Claude McKay, who comes from Jamaica, explained when he came to the US, it was the first time I had ever come face to face with, with such manifest implacable hatred of my race and my feelings were indescribable. I had heard of prejudice in America, but never dreamed of it being so intensely bitter. I have quotes from Harrison to the same effect and from Marcus Garvey to the same effect. Harrison says, during the Danish days, there were superior and inferior peoples, uh, but if the lines of social and economic cleavage at any time at any time followed those of chromatics, I know of no such thing. It, it, they lived in a world very different from what he encountered in the U.S. From 1903 to 1910, Harrison had 14 articles published in the New York Times. This is including beginning when he's in high school in New York. He comes to New York and he tries, he goes to high school and he goes for a few years. I don't know that he ever finished because I've never been able to certify that he finished um, and he didn't go to college. But then around 1905, he gets involved in black intellectual working class circles in the West 50s out of two church lyceums. The most prominent one was St. Benedict the Moor Lyceum on West 53rd Street. And it had Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, Johnny Bruce, Williana Jones, later Williana Jones Burroughs, Charles Burroughs, and others. And these forums would meet uh, weekly. They were place Afro-Caribbeans and African-Americans would come together. There would be freewheeling discussion and debate. You didn't bite your tongue, but you could leave and be friends and, you know, go home afterward and, you know, continue to talk about things. A very healthy intellectual atmosphere. In 1908, 1907, 8, and 9, he worked at the White Rose Home uh, for Colored Working uh, Women. And it was the, the person running it at that time was Frances Reynolds Kaiser, who uh, was a first uh, Black woman to graduate from what later became Hunter College. And she was had been a very close friend of Paul Lawrence Dunbar and later would become a, a, a founding member of the NAACP and a close confidant of Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, and Harrison would go there and he would teach classes on race history to the adults. 
and also teach kindergarten classes to the youngsters. And in this period, he started his diary, his the second startup of his diary on September 18, 1907. And his diary was preserved in his papers. And when I mentioned that his papers are online at Columbia, one of the real gems is his 210 plus page diary, which you can read for yourself in his writing. And he writes very legibly. In 1908, Harrison writes a letter to Miss Kaiser, to Miss Francis Reynolds Kaiser, detailing his break from religion. It was a torturous break because he had been brought up, you know, and he believed the tenets of uh, uh, the church he had been brought up in in St. Croix. But he, he, he concludes his letter to her, now I am ag an agnostic as Thomas Huxley was, and my principles are the same. To Huxley, agnosticism was not a creed, but a method, the essence of which was the fundamental axiom of modern science. You follow your reason as far as it will take you, and you do not pretend that conclusions are certain which are not demonstrated or demonstrable. So Harrison got active in the free thought movement, and free thought was thought free of religious dogma. Uh, it, it believed in the human origins of the Old and New Testaments, denied the infallibility of the Bible, denied the existence of heaven and hell, um, advocated free inquiry, free discussion, free publicity of ideas, and a scientific method. In Harrison's era, amongst the leading free thinkers were Elizabeth K Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, Mar Margaret Sanger, Horace Greeley, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Clarence Darrow, Eugene Debs, Samuel Clemens, uh, Clemens, Lucy Parsons, two early leaders of the Communist Party, Louis, uh, Louis Fraina and Charles Ruthenberg, and A. Philip Randolph and Carl Sandburg. Amongst black free thinkers in this period were Rogers, Cloyd McKay, J. Rogers, Cloyd McKay, Cyril Briggs, Richard B. Moore, Hodge Kiernan from Montserrat, and W.E.B. Du Bois, as indicated by his biographer, David Levering Lewis, who says that Du Bois was, quote, an agnostic and an anti-clerical. In 1909, Harrison marries Irene Louise Horton Harrison. She comes from Demerara through the Caribbean up to New York. They would wind up having five children together. They lived for the most part at 231 West 134th Street. And I have pictures of those, that building in there in the books. Um, as Harrison starts to get more politically active while he's working in the post office, Harrison gets hired by the post office in 1907. And in 1910, while he's working in the, he considered Booker T. Washington a subservient. There was a debate going on in the early years between Booker T. Washington and Du Bois, and he considered himself more aligned with Du Bois. But um, when, um, du, when Booker T. went to Europe in 19. 11 uh, and offered some uh, statements on conditions in the US, Harrison wrote some rejoinders and he basically said, uh, Booker T, you're free to say what you want, but you should tell the truth. You should speak accurately. In the meanwhile, Du Bois get, got together a petition from about 50 prominent people and also criticized Du Bois, uh, uh, Washington. But Washington and his right-hand man, Emmett Scott, using the Postmaster General of New York, one of their uh, people in their network, his name was Morgan, uh, had Harrison summarily fired from the post office. For those familiar with New York City Postal, I, I worked in the post office for 33 years. The big post office on the West 38th, 39th Street is Morgan Station. It's the largest uh, post office in New York uh, uh, for employees. And Morgan had Harrison summarily fired. I was able to get Harrison's POD7, his postal record, and it was clean until he was removed for speaking out. Harrison also developed criticisms of the NAACP in this early period. He felt that the NAACP had no answer as to what happens if the white minds at which you are aiming remain unaffected. He thought the NAACP was limited by white people's views of how black people should act. And I go into all of this stuff in detail with his specifics and why he thinks this and what some of their statements were that led him to that. Jeffrey, just one second, Jeffrey? Yeah. 
I would just like to interrupt you because I can actually, uh, I transferred your file. So I could actually open the PowerPoint now if you'd like. You can open it, great. Yes, what page are you on? I'm on number 66. Okay. Thank you, um, thank sure. you for sticking with me. So I'm going to open page 66. I don't know if you can return to our- um, yeah, Oh, there you are. There we are. 66. So let me put 66 and then we can continue from here. I'm gonna present. Okay. Oh, we lost it, what happened? No, 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 it will come back. Just one second, there we go. Nice job, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Is everybody okay out there? <laughs> Can't see anybody. Yeah. It's okay, you will in a minute. Once we're done, we'll go back to the full screen. Because Muriel said we're gonna have a lot of time for discussion later, so. Right. I just wanna get this out there so you're introduced Sorry. to you. Is now. it, um, is it going by, is this the right page? Uh, no, that uh, that's the beginning. That's the beginning, it went back to the beginning. Okay, let me minimize yeah, here so down. I can follow. Um, yeah, you're getting close. Oh, you just passed it, okay, yep. 66. And then can I advance it or you can advance it? I have to advance it, sadly. Okay, it's 66. On my so around 1910, W.E.B. Du Bois was editor of the NAACP's Crisis Magazine. Next page. I'm trying to present, but when I present, I go back to the beginning. So I'm going to continue no, from no, here. Let me, see, let me see if I hit on it. Nope. No, no, no. It's it's with me. So just uh, if you just go ahead, I will just I will keep it on the smaller screen, so people uh, can at least see it. Oh, oh, good. Now, yeah, you you just moved it. Great. Yes. Um, so now Harrison was also critical of Du Bois's notion of the talented tenth. Du Bois is associated with this notion. Um, because Du Bois said the talented tenth were the educated and gifted who must be made leaders of thought and missionaries of culture among their people. Harrison felt that the talent, the so-called talented tenth hadn't provided the leadership that was needed. They should come down from their Mount Sinai, and he didn't think that the colored leadership implicit in the notion of the talented tenth was uh, preordained to lead uh, the quote Negro people. Next slide. Okay, so Harrison then joins after he fired from the post office, he gets very active with the Socialist Party. Socialist Party was in a period of growth by 1912. It had started out in 1908, got 3% of the vote. It had a very progressive platform. It was anti-monopolies and trusts. It wanted to nationalize a lot of industries. It advocated eight hour workday, graduated income tax, women's suffrage. This was a, a full decade before it was achieved public works programs. And by 1912, it got 6% of the vote in the uh, election. Next slide. Uh, Harrison wrote some of the first major theoretical pieces by a black person on the Negro and socialism. In He, so, he wrote in The Call, which was the paper of the New York Socialist Party. In November 28th, he began a major five-part theoretical series. And it was the first such effort. Next slide. Uh, as a socialist the theoretician, Harrison argued that racial oppression was socio-historic, not biological, very important. He proposed a new litmus test for socialists, champion the cause of African-Americans as a revolutionary doctrine. He advocated, he said it was the duty of all to oppose race prejudice, and he initiated a colored socialist club. It wasn't exclusively for uh, people of color, but it was to uh, re, you know, address some of the special, make special appeals to the Negro people. Next. Um, Harrison, there were two main factions in the Socialist Party in this period, the political and the industrial. The political thought the way to socialism was evolutionary. You, you know, you just get, you get more votes and you win yourself into office. And the industrial thought you needed militant actions and relative, uh, you know, revolutionary struggles to lead to socialism. And Harrison's response was to each of them, whatever you're advocating, you need black, black people. <laughs> you need black voters, you need black workers. Next slide. Uh, he challenged, again, the two main props of white supremacy, the ideological props. The idea that racism is a innate 
and the idea that, quote, white workers benefit from race prejudice. He challenged these ideas. These ideas are still common today, and we might talk about them later. Go on. But yeah, Alan also challenges them. So I, I, I hit focus on that. <clears throat> One of Harrison's startling comments, I think, was the following written in 1911 in the Socialist Party Press. He writes, politically, the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. The presence of the Negro puts our democracy to the test and reveals the falsity of it. True democracy and equality implies a revolution startling to even think of. Let me just say a little more on this. A touchstone is a black stone you rub the metal against it to see if it's really the gold it purports to be. It's a wonderful metaphor. Any issue you look at in society, housing, education, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How are black people faring? What are we gonna do about it? It's a wonderful guide for practice and action. Next slide. Harrison wrote in 1912, in the International Socialist Review, that was the national publication of Socialist Party, that the mission of the Socialist Party is to free the working class from exploitation and the duty of the party to champion the Negro's cause is as clear as day. This is the crucial test of socialism sincerity. I note down below that Du Bois said something very similar, but a year later. And of course, Du Bois, quote, for many years got all the attention, but Harrison had it in a national publication of the Socialist Party in 1912. Next slide. Also in the um, International Socialist Review, he, he did uh, three articles in the International Socialist Review, but this statement by Harrison is, I think, profound. And he says the 10 million Negroes of America form a group that is more essentially proletarian and under slavery, they were the most thoroughly exploited of the American proletarian. Next slide. Now, understanding that enslaved black labor was proletarian is important for the following three reasons. It provides examples of valiant struggles in labor history. I, I can't tell you, you know, I started out researching Harrison and Allen reading labor histories, you know, and people would talk about the labor movement beginning in the 1830s or the 40s, you know, just ignoring black labor entirely. But this provide enslaved black labor is proletarian provides examples of valiant struggles in labor history. Two, it helps to tear the cover from centuries of white labor betrayals and apologists. Well, you know, way back in particular, but still, well, yeah, we maybe didn't support them, but they weren't laborers. We had the laborers, you know, those type of arguments. And three, and this is very important, understanding black labor as proletarian helps to understand the invention and role of the white race as a ruling class social control formation in response to labor solidarity. And that's one of the main theses of Theodore W. Allen, which we'll talk about later in the year. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, we've discussed that, the new duty of the play. Next slide. Uh, good, the twofold character of democracy. We just, we did that, okay. Oh, wait, wait, I wanna say something on this. Harrison understood the twofold character of democracy in America. Next, next slide. And this is where he gets a little dialectical. Uh, Karl Marx, when he's writing to Engels about capital, says the essence of this book is to understand the twofold character of labor as use value and as exchange value. And I think that Harrison understood the twofold character of democracy in America. Because we hear the phrase democracy uh, used often, but if it's a lily white democracy or a white supremacist democracy, it's a retardant to progressive social change. However, if it's a genuine and thoroughgoing democracy, it is a catalyst for radical social change. So I think people should constantly consider the twofold character of democracy in America. Next slide. Pro um, yeah, okay. Uh, 
Harrison in 1912 uh, is campaigning vigorously uh, for uh, Debs in the 1912 presidential election. And the New York Times has coverage of him going down to Wall Street uh, in September of 1912 and at the corner of Broad and Wall, getting out on his soapbox and speaking from one to four as far as his voice could, to an audience that extended as far as his voice could reach on socialism. And according to the Times, Harrison, an eloquent, an eloquent and forceful Negro speaker shattered all rec records for distance in an address on socialism in front of the stock exchange yesterday. Uh, his voice carried to the furthermost limits. And what I just want to comment on that is that is, to me, it was very clearly a precursor to Occupy Wall Street, you know, many decades later. Next slide. Okay, also in 1912, prior to the Socialist Party convention, Harrison poses in one of his articles in the International Socialist Review, uh, an article on um, Asian, uh, on, uh, he says, uh, he poses to him, what's it gonna be? Uh, class consciousness, are you gonna address the Negro question or not? And in a position, uh, the, the Socialist Party doesn't even address the Negro question, but they do take a position on Asian immigration. And it's one of the most backward positions in the history of the left. And they argue that race, this is the Socialist Party argues, Race feeling is not so much a result of social as of biological evolution. It is deeper than any class feeling and will outlast the capitalist system. Class consciousness must be learned, but race consciousness is inborn and cannot be wholly unlearned. This is exactly what Harrison was arguing against. Okay, next slide. Harrison's, as I mentioned before, he's campaigning vigorously for Debs in 1912. Uh, next slide, you, uh, Henry Miller, sees Harrison on the soapbox in this period. He's a, a very famous writer, particularly in the 60s, 70s when I'm growing up. And he refers to Harrison as his quantum idol on the soapbox. We can skip ahead. Uh, next slide. We don't have to read all the words of Miller here. You can read them. But he, he just said he was extraordinary as an orator. Harrison supported the industrial workers of the world. They called for one big union, uh, industrial unions over racist and exclusionary craft unions organized skilled and unskilled workers together. They advocated racial equality, direct action. They defended sabotage. They organized in the Deep South. Next slide. And here he is. He's the only black speaker at the famous 1913 Patterson Silk Strike. And he's there alongside Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Big Bill Haywood, and a number of the IWW speakers. Um, a major um, labor radical activist, Harrison. Um, next slide. Harrison left the Socialist Party, and when he left the Socialist Party, he offered, please listen, he offered what is arguably the most profound but least heated criticism in US left history. He stated simply, that the Socialist Party, like the labor movement, has insisted on white race first and class after, that it put the white race first before class. So he leaves the socialist and he turns towards independent radicalism. Okay, next slide. From 1914 and 15, he's active with the free thought movement, the free speech movement, birth control, and he writes on racial aspects of the war. Next slide. One of the places he gets involved with is the modern school. It, it was an important focus of cultural and social ferment, socialism, syndicalism, revolution, birth control, free love, cubism, futurism. All these modern currents of thought were discussed there. And some of the anarchists who, who spoke there, Goldman, Alexander Berkman, um, single tax advocate Morton, um, Elizabeth Burley Flynn, William English uh, Walling. Uh, philosopher Will Dur Durant, Clarence Darrow, and Harrison uh, was uh, taught there for a while. So he was active in these circles around 1915. Next slide. Then he, he starts turning, he starts turning by 1916, he starts turning towards a focus 
on Harlem. Next slide. He's prompted to move in that direction uh, by Gertrude Cohen, who's a librarian at the 135th Street Library, and James Weldon Johnson, who's an editorial writer of the age and also uh, author of the uh, Black, uh, the Negro National Anthem and later a very prominent figure in the NAACP. And Johnson says, an open air lecture course in Harlem, if Harrison would offer that, it would save, serve as a university extension carried to the uh, furthest, farthest point. He rec ha recommended Harrison to giving lectures, uh, which would be more than equivalent to a year of college and of incalculable benefit to the community. Next slide. Harrison also was moved towards work in the Harlem community by reviews he started doing of uh, the Negro actors and um, uh, the, some of the early Negro theater productions. And uh, there's a number of them I discuss. And uh, James Weldon Johnson, uh, skip to the next slide. Amongst the people he, whose work he really appreciated was Charles Gilpin. And uh, Harrison discusses Gilpin's work in the, early in the early materials, but also when he plays the Emperor Jones in the early 1920s. Amongst those next slides, next two slides, Har amongst those following Harrison in this period, A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen. And then next slide. Harrison, next slide, yeah. Harrison is advocating race unity from the bottom up. He, said, he writes that the fault with previous efforts was that the uniters, such as Booker T. Washington, W. E. Du Bois, had generally gone at the problem from the wrong end. They have begun at the top when they should have begun at the bottom. To attempt to unite the intellectuals at the top was not the same thing as uniting the Negro masses, the key to racial solidarity. I note at the bottom, interestingly, in his 1940 autobiography, Dusk of Dawn, Du Bois reached a similar conclusion. Next slide. The Militant New Negro, okay, Harrison founds the Militant New Negro movement late 1916, early 1917. Here we go, next slide. He does a couple of uh, talks in Patterson, but uh, the New Negro movement that he's founding is race conscious, it's internationalist, it's mass based, it strives for political equality, social justice, civic opportunity and economic opportunity and defense of self, family and race in the face of lynching and white supremacy. Next slide. Very important date. Uh, oh, it's also proactive uh, and it wants to mobilize the Negro's political power, pocketbook power and intellectual powers, which were within the Negro's control without depending upon or waiting for the cooperative action of white people because such action may not come. Next slide. This is a very important date and I hope you can see the slide but this is June 12th, 1917. Down below, next to where it says come, you see Harrison's the featured speaker, but there was Adam Clayton Powell Sr. spoke. Um, who else? I, um, Marcus Garvey comes and gets invited to this, but there are a couple of other important speakers there. And Harrison calls uh, a meeting. Woodrow Wilson had just led the United States into World War I to quote, make the world safe for democracy. And Harrison's response was stop lynching and disfranchisement and make the South safe for democracy. And Harrison's protest and his rally, which was the, marked the uh, founding of the Liberty League had over a thousand people in attendance on 132nd Street. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So again, the Liberty League focused. Uh, it wanted to make the um, uh, make um, a large measure of democracy for the peoples of the world, and not just uh, Harrison. Really wanted to push that. Be very internationalist. He opposed lynching, segregation, disfranchisement with this new movement. Next slide. He advocated enforcement of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, federal anti-lynching legislation, political voice, and militant armed self-defense. And I'll note, and I note in the book, the NAACP was not going this far in this period because things like federal anti-lynching legislation, et cetera, some of the other items 
Uh, they didn't want to advocate too, too outwardly because they didn't want to alienate Southern white support. And, and I, did, I cite examples and quotes and things like that. Uh, Harrison made clear that this new Negro movement represented a breaking away of the Negro masses from the grip of the old time leaders. This is when he comes out with The Voice on July 4th, 1917. That was the first newspaper of the militant new Negro movement, Harrison's newspaper, The Voice. Next slide. Um, and he again talks that The Voice wanted to organize to secure the ballot, it was very important to their overall effort. And they wanted to organize those votes independently in their, uh, so they could function in their own interests. Next slide. He stressed the international duty and responsibility to the 1700 millions who are colored, black, brown, and yellow, and who seek to live free from the domination of white minority. And he, uh, the numbers, I, I've got to check again because at another point he talks about, I think it was a later period, talks about a special sympathy for the 250 million of our brethren in Africa. But the next slide, in this period, Harrison develops a tricolor flag, black, brown, and yellow. And he says he chose those colors because that's the colors that we are domestically and internationally, very profound concept. And from this tricolor, Marcus Garvey would switch to the red, black, and green, which people know today is the black liberation colors. But Harrison has some comments on that switch and you'll find them in the book. Uh, next slide. Amongst those who are following Harrison, it should be more as a socialist, African blood brotherhood, communist orator. Next slide. Marcus Garvey is following Harrison. Garvey actually joins Harrison's Liberty League. He's not one to join anyone else's organization for those familiar with Garvey's history. Next, 1917, uh, July 2nd, uh, we just passed an anniversary of this event. Uh, East St. Louis, there was a series of racial pogroms on the East St. Louis uh, community sparked and they were led by uh, labor leaders who complained about uh, black people taking white men's jobs, such concepts as that. And if you flip to the next side, in this picture there's a black man in front of the streetcar getting attacked. But um, the, uh, the protest rally came, Harrison's protest rally on July 4th, uh, came at a rally on 138th Street, over a thousand black men and women at the Metropolitan Baptist Church. And it came in the wake of two series of white supremacist pogroms, May 27th to 30th and July 1st to 3rd against the African-American community of East St. Louis. And once again, drawing parallels today to today, East St. Louis, Illinois, which was under attack, is only 12 short miles from Ferguson, Missouri, where um, a few years ago, just a, sure, just a few years ago, uh, we had incident which led to major protests in Harlem and elsewhere. Um, but estimates of the number of African Americans killed in East St. Louis range from 39 to 250. Next slide. In 1917, Harrison came out with his first book, The Negro and the Nation, 1917. Next slide. 1918, Harrison uh, and William Monroe Trotter. Harrison's in the front row. As we look at the photo, he's there with his hand, with his arms crossed, and he's sitting next to William Monroe Trotter. They convened a Liberty Congress. It was the major black protest effort in wartime America. Uh, they wanted to protest a host of things, uh, you know, uh, for um, more equality, enforcement of 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Etc. Go on, next slide. Trotter was the co chair. Next slide. Jolie Spingarn. Next slide. People don't know this. Jolie Spingarn was a Columbia University professor. He was the, go back one slide, please. He was the head of the NAACP. Can you go back one? Yeah, good. He was the head of the NAACP for a number of years. He was, by Du Bois's own admission, Du Bois's close white, closest white friend. He would also often financially aid Du Bois. And um, he um, tried to talk to a Trotter about not holding the Liberty Congress as a protest effort during World War I because Spingarn was pro-war. 
He got no place with Trotter. He wouldn't even waste time trying to talk to Harrison. He knew he'd get no place. And here he is in his military garb because amongst other things, Spingarn was a major in military intelligence. Now, why this is also important is to this day, the NAACP gives its award for outstanding achievement by a black American in his name. It's called the Spingarn Medal. And I don't think people are as widely aware of this role of Jolie Spingarn as perhaps they should be. Next slide. Now, Du Bois makes his own decisions, but he, he does talk with Spingarn quite a bit. And in this period, he decides to write an editorial entitled Close Ranks. And he writes it while he, Du Bois, is applying for a captaincy in military intelligence. Again, that's the branch of the government that monitors the black and the radical community. And Du Bois writes this editorial. It's only one paragraph long. If you skip to the next slide, you'll see the essence of it. Du Bois writes, let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances. And Harrison and others know what they were, lynching segregation and disfranchisement and close ranks shoulder to shoulder with our, white, with our own white fellow citizens and allied nations that are fighting for democracy. Next slide. Okay, we move to volume two, and this is where we get into it. It's a big, very big volume, and there's much in it, so I'm just going to go through briefly what we encounter in volume two, and I encourage people to read it. Next slide. There's the picture. Okay, next slide. Uh, now, just reviewing, Harrison had been a leader in the struggle against all these forces. Uh, uh, and it found that the left and left movement put the white race first before class. He, he, he found it important to struggle for political, uh, political equality against white supremacy. Next slide. In, in parts, in the second volume is presented in roughly chronological order. Part one covers his pioneering uh, role that gave direction to the militant new Negro movement he had founded and led. And it covers the period 1918 to 1919. Part two details his outstanding contributions. It, part two goes from 1920 to 22 as writer for and editor of the Negro world. It discusses his differences with Marcus Garvey as well as his differences with black, black socialists um, and makes clear that Harrison's writings and literary influence, including his book review and poetry for the people columns, contributed significantly to the climate leading up to Locke's 1925 publication, New Negro. Next slide. Part, part three covers 22 to 24 and focuses on his prolific and wide ranging writing and speaking as an independent freelance educator including his work as a public lecturer with the New York City Board of Education and his writing a regular column for the Boston Chronicle for six months. And uh, wonderful little column, wonderful little articles in a regular column by Harrison. And part four <coughs> covers the last years of his life from 24 to 27 and examines his innovative and more broadly unitary efforts in his la last years including the founding, founding of the International Colored Unity League and its organ, The Voice of the Negro. Next slide. Chapter one in volume two, he returns from the Liberty Congress. Uh, you'll see uh, he resurrects the voice. He, um, he stresses uh, race consciousness. He's under surveillance all this period. And I discussed that in some depth. Next slide. Um, upon his return, although a black leader of national prominence, he had no regular employment or source of income, and he had serious financial problems. One of the key points I'm making in this, particularly in the second volume, is when you look at Harrison in relation to Garvey, um, to Du Bois, to Randolph Owen, and A. Philip Randolph, and Cyril Briggs, follow the money see how they're getting money or being financed and it'll help you understand much more deeply what they're dealing with and what's going on. 
Next slide. So Harrison resurrects the voice. Uh, it, it, he had an ended publication in 1917, but when he comes back from the Liberty Congress in 1918, he resurrects the voice. He's got a list of um, incorporated who are largely laboring class people. I have some of their names mentioned here. Next slide. On his board of directors, again, it's some of the same people who were mentioned in the previous slide, but a few people of note are George Frazier Miller, Reverend at St. Augustine's Church in Brooklyn, uh, James Cornelius Lionel Kanagata, an organizer of the Pullman Porters Union, but interestingly, his, he, he's from St. Croix also, whose son would later become the well-known actor Canada Lee, and the journalist Johnny Bruce, a friend of Harrison from St. Benedict's Lyceum a decade earlier. Next slide. Um, when Harrison, Harrison takes, to do, takes to task Du Bois's 1918 uh, editorial in, in his own editorial, The Descent of Du Bois. And he quotes again what Du Bois said, let us while this war lasts forget. And Harrison points out everybody knew what those special grievances were and uh, Next slide, again, and well, I'll just say that, uh, oh, the editorial and events surrounding cast grave doubts on Du Bois's leadership and marked Harrison as a spearhead in the opposition to close ranks. Some 19 years after Du Bois' death in 1963 and almost 64 years after his 1918 editorial, the historian Herbert Aptecker, the editor of Du Bois' writings and correspondence offered a revealing comment on this subject. Aptecker wrote that the close rank statement produced a flood of discussion, pro and con, that's Du Bois's uh, statement, with much of it printed in subsequent issues of the crisis. It took some 20 years before, du before Du Bois came to the conclusion that those who opposed to the statement were in the right. That's deep. And he doesn't even cite a source for this. Aptecker just puts that in there. Next slide, next slide. Chapter two, Harrison now boldly, he started up the voice and he boldly wants to take his message to the South. And he's going down, he goes to Washington DC to begin speaking. And then he's gonna go into Virginia on a speaking tour. And uh, I go into that in some great detail. And also an incident, he gets involved uh, with more uh, surveillance in something in, called the Moens case, which we can talk about later if people want to. Next slide. Here's an example of the new Negro in 1919. And I don't, yeah, if you can, uh, oh yeah, the, the new Negro. And uh, this is the August 19. And uh, the new Negro is uh, the man who first coined the phrase in the announcement, it describes him as the man who first coined the phrase the new Negro and chiseled the path which the new Negro has taken. Hubert Harrison is the editor of the magazine. The new Negro is, uh, it's a magazine for the new Negro and he has other catchy phrases about it elsewhere. Next slide. In this, art, in this issue, he writes on our larger duty in the August 19 issue, uh, described the principal task of the new Negro as a development of the international consciousness of the darker races, especially of the Negro race. No, next slide. Another major editorial he writes in that August 1919 issue is as the currents flow. And he proclaimed the new Negro a fate accompli and Negroes, he said, were rejecting the unmanly teaching, and the new Negro was identifying himself with every progressive and radical movement and was uncomp and was uncompromising and nonpartisan and owed, and owed nothing to any political party. Next slide. And he has, again, the new Negro is Negro first, Negro last, and Negro always, and an eye for an eye, a tooth for the tooth, and sometimes two eyes or a half dozen teeth for one is the aim of the new Negro. At the very bottom, you'll see a link, but in, in my volume two, that link will take you right to the Hubert Harrison 
papers online, including his diary. But uh, in my volume two, particularly in the footnotes, there are many, many links in the footnotes where if Harrison's reviewing a book, you can link to the book he's reviewing and you can link to the review he writes. It's a wonderful resource. Next slide. Uh, this is the September issue and uh, Harrison describes the New Negro as a monthly magazine of a different sort. Next issue, next slide. In October, he has some wonderful articles, The Women of Our Race, Education in West Africa, The White War and the Colored, and the Colored Races, and Two Negro Radicalisms. Next slide. In Two Negro Radicalisms, Harrison, for the first time, publicly stated that Marcus Garvey was effect effectively publicizing, quote, racialism, race consciousness, and racial solidarity as, as had been advocated by the voice. Next slide, chapter four. Uh, chapter four. This is when he starts moving towards the Negro world. This has some very interesting background on the early years of the Garvey movement, internal and external dif uh, difficulties in that movement. And then it goes into how Garvey approaches Harrison in December of 1919 and first asks him to head a college he's planning to uh, start, but he really wants Harrison to become the editor of the Negro World because he recognizes, as does very, most everyone else, that Harrison's a great editor and journalist. And um, so Harrison, I go through the story of how Harrison goes up to meet him. He's a bit appalled by the conditions of the office, and uh, but he says, yes, he will work for the Negro World. Next slide. Yeah, that's where he first offers him the presidency of the new college. Then the next slide. Uh, yeah, then, then that's when Garvey tells him he wants him to do the Negro world. Next slide. And this, this just lays out in, in, in Harrison reshapes the Negro world. In 1920, Harrison significantly reshaped the Negro world and turned it into the nation's foremost radical race conscious paper. The publication under his editorship swept the globe and became the world's leading international organ of black thought. The historian Tony Martin considered the most effective of Garvey's propaganda devices to be his newspapers and the most important of these papers and possibly the greatest single propaganda device to be the Negro world. As this paper spread its race conscious message, the UNIA grew into the largest and claimed Garvey, the richest organization in the United States. Next slide. Harrison in this period early, he begins in January working on the paper, but by May, he starts writing in his diary at first, some of his thoughts on Garvey. He thought it was important to get them down, you know? And so he began by recounting some of Garvey's, some of what he thinks of Garvey. And he, he talks of, uh, he began by recounting some of his history with Garvey. Then he describes how the Liberty League was organized and Garvey used to follow basically everything we did. Everything I did, he copied. Sometimes uh, Harrison even closed his meetings in Lafayette Hall. So uh, people could go down the hall and go to Garvey's meetings. But when Garvey started attracting a larger crowd, he never did the same for Harrison. Um, going on. He has much more to say, but that's a touch of it. Uh, here, but he, he goes on to say, the first big defect then in Mr. Garvey's is a defect in the size of his soul. He is spiritually as intellectually a little man. That is why he doesn't want around him men or of larger girth either way. Or if he gets them, he does not utilize them in any way. Elaborating further on this, Harrison, in his personal copy of Jerome Dowd's The Negro Races, underlined Dowd's comments on how in primitive societies, the king is the most gaudily dressed and how his subjects or inferiors seek in all possible ways to flatter him and magnify his greatness. They fawn at his feet and lavish upon him thousands of complimentary phrases and thousands of little attentions. Harrison compared the first to Garvey's imperial costume, 
if, if people have seen some of the old pictures of Garvey, even ones that are on covers of books, in the and the second to Garvey, Garvey's retinue of sycophants, that people just following somewhat blindly. This is how Harrison referred to it. And of course, in the, 19, in the, in the 2000 teens, I guess, we've had some updated versions of some of this. Next slide. Chapter five, the debate with the emancipator and the crab barrel. And uh, Harrison goes into debates with the leading socialists of the day. And uh, I go into that and this is Randolph and Owen and Domingo. They're all voicing opinions, but they really want Harrison to lead, to take the lead of their left-wing movement. But Harrison refuses to because he, does, he doesn't want to, uh, he wants to maintain his independence and uh, he doesn't want to, uh, matter of fact, in 1921, he turns down um, money from the communists uh, to lead their organization because he, he uh, reportedly didn't want to be their stalking horse against Marcus Harvey. Next slide. Harrison Wright, we're, we're getting close to the finish here. He writes in 19, uh, uh, he writes on the Duluth, Minnesota lynchings, very big event. In, a, in 1920, in June, and he writes, and he has a, uh, uh, he writes, lynching its cause and cure. Let's see if we have it there. Yeah, he quotes from the John Shalady, the resignation from the NACP, uh, and he cites proof from the governor after the Duluth, Minnesota lynching, which was described as one of the most cynically brutal that occurred north and south in the last 10 years. Next slide. Here's a picture of um, three of the African-American circus workers who were lynched and with a crowd just standing around, many smiling on June 15th, 1920 in Duluth, Minnesota, right? People don't always associate that with lynching. Next slide. Harrison worked well with black poets, including Claude McKay, Lucian Watkins, Walter Everett uh, Hawkins. And he also encouraged efforts from his friend, Andy Razaf, and from, ne uh, from Negro World Readers when he established the Poetry for the People section in the paper. Next slide. One of the interesting things Harrison did, one of the articles he wrote in this period was You Need a Biscuit. Now, You Need a Biscuit was an advertising campaign of the National Biscuit Company. And here's one of their promos that would appear on bulletin, on, you know, uh, big outdoor postings and things like that and uh, telling people you need a biscuit. And next slide. That one, yeah. And Harrison uh, said uh, the you need a biscuit was a popular slogan of National Biscuit Company. Even if ignored at first, the advertisement reached one's inner consciousness by its constant insistence and prompted people to decide that perhaps after all, we do need a biscuit. And then he goes on to draw some parallels and to say, well, they've been telling us we need democracy. And uh, if they keep telling us we need democracy, we're going to take them at their word and start demanding it. And uh, so he would turn even common things like that into very important campaigns and educational devices. Next slide. In our book review section, which he starts in the Negro world, he wrote the first and only regular book review. He was the first and only regular book review section known to Negro newspaperdom. Next slide. Uh, in, in chapter seven, I, I go into depth. Sorry about misspelling my own name. About um, the Garvey Convention, and uh, people will find that very interesting. And in this period, next slide, he comes out with his book. When Africa Awakes, which has 53 articles. That's again, the inside story of the stirrings and strivings of the new Negro in the Western world, um, because he wanted to get out and record for posterity his role in the founding of the new Negro movement. And in it, he writes a very important introductory, which doesn't appear in some of the other reprints. In the original, it's there. It doesn't appear in some of the other reprints, but does appear in the reprint uh, which I did with Diasporic Africa Press. I encourage people to get that one from their library or to obtain it from Diasporic Africa Press. 
Next slide. Uh, Harrison continued to write, although he, after the convention of August 1920, he ceased working as a uh, managing editor of the Negro World, and he, um, but he continued to write, and he wrote a lot of book reviews and some very important articles and pieces, and he was very prolific in his writings in his period. I go into a lot of those writings. Next slide. Um, okay. At the Negro World, once again, he uh, started the book review section. He started the poetry for the people section. He also started the West Indian news notes section, and he attracted many writers who hadn't been writing for Barbie's paper to write for that paper. Uh, next slide. And I go through and name many of them. There'll be names people know. Uh, now, Harrison wrote a little piece on how to review books. And this piece was quoted by, amongst others, Scott McNamee, who was on the executive board of the National Book Critics Association and uh, others. But in it, Harrison says, in the first place, if you're going to write a book review, remember, in a book review, you're writing for a public that wants to know whether it is worth their while to read the book about which they are not, uh, primarily interested more in the book and how the and what the author sets to himself to do and how he does it, rather than in your own private loves and hates. In the next place, respect. This is very important. Respect yourself and your office so much that you will not complacently pass and praise, dribble and rubbish. Give honest service. Only so will your opinion come to have weight with your readers, and therefore read widely and be well informed. Get the widest basis of knowledge for your judgment, then back your judgments to the limit. And that's the type of reviewer Harrison was. A wonderful book reviewer. Next slide. Um, in this period, again, he's writing. Um, one of his major pieces is Wanted a Colored International. Next slide, which I have just, the, again, the picture of the tricolor flag. But that editorial is a very powerful editorial he writes in that period. Also in 1921, Harrison writes on the Tulsa riots, which have been in the news recently. And Harrison is coming out of New York again and taking the lead and commenting on that. In a piece I did a couple of weeks ago that widely distributed. Next slide. Next slide. All right. Uh, in 1921 and 22, He's writing again on imperialist America. He's writing on J. Lothrop Stoddard, whose book, uh, T. Lothrop Stoddard, excuse me, whose book um, in 1920 was the, uh, was the biggest seller of that sort in the country, um, talking about race and race relations. Uh, West Indian news notes columns. He's, he, he offers some wonderful pieces, including the Black Tide Turns in Politics. Next slide. Uh, I discuss how Garvey is now in trouble legally, and I go through all of that. Harrison gives a statement and memoranda to the investigators, as do many other people, Cyril Briggs and a host of others. Um, they were, they, Harrison Briggs, they were, not only them, a lot of the black leaders were of the opinion that uh, Garvey was uh, misleading the people and uh, taking money from them that uh, he shouldn't be, you know, next slide. Uh, Harrison begins work in 22 for the New York City Board of Education, continues doing his book reviews. He does for a period work with the single tax movement. Um, and in this period, William Pickens uh, writes a wonderful laudatory uh, evaluation of Harrison as, a, as an orator, which I quote, and discuss. Harrison also does an interesting and laudatory review of Carter, one of Carter Woodson's books. Next slide. In 1923, Harrison challenges the KKK in Patterson, New Jersey. Now Harrison will come out to Patterson after the, the Klan burns a cross on Garrett Mountain outside Patterson in 1923. Later in 24, he'll go out to the Midwest when the Klan is rising 
in Indiana and places like that, and he'll challenge the can. He's, he's really fearless. And um, uh, so, you know, I, I go into and discuss that, but I, I also in this chapter discuss Harrison's article after, after Garvey is convicted, Harrison writes an extremely interesting and deep article, Marcus Garvey at the Bar of United States Justice, which is really worth a read by people. And then he does a very long article on the Virgin Islands for the nation, which they refuse to publish. And it's a very stunning piece. And to this day, activists from the Virgin Islands are reading it because they think it's so insightful. Next slide. Um, Harrison also in this period spoke at uh, New York's City Hall uh, at the Al uh, and on March 10th on the Brother in Black. And uh, he also spoke at Cooper Union. And each of these talks were recorded for uh, broadcasting from radio station WJEZ and were sent to the Edison Company in Newark, New Jersey. Now, I've, I have never in all my years research been able to come up with a video or an audio of Harrison <coughs> speaking or lecturing, but I've not given up hope. I have learned not to give up hope. And I believe that these audios may be out there. There are still, when I last checked, over a million unidentified uh, items in, in those collections at the Edison uh, collections in uh, outside. I think they're in Edison now, yeah. Uh, the Edison collections outside New York. Uh, next slide. Um, in 23, Harrison dug another radio station on uh, radio talk on the Negro and the nation. And he talks about the Negro and the nation. It's again, these are very deep and probing essays he does. Next slide. This is the year 1924 when he's lecturing for the Board of Education and he writes for the Boston Chronicle. And then in 1924, he, uh, there's plans to come out with a publication which would, be, which would wind up being the survey graphic issue of the New Negro, which would lead to Alain Locke's New Negro. And in the preliminary draft of materials for that, one of the first four articles, I believe, was, ha was Harrison's article from 1918 I think, uh, on the white world and the colored, uh, uh, the white war and the colored races. And uh, I think that was the title. He wrote two of similar titles. And uh, when they came down time to publishing um, this was the survey graphic edition, Harrison's article was removed. And uh, historian Barbara Foley, as I recall, um, says, I went through these records too, the records are up in Minnesota, um, that she believed it was it concluded that Harrison's article was too radical for the publication, which is consistent with what he often faced. Next slide. Harrison's last organization, International Colored Unity League, I wanted to do for Negro that which the Negro has to be done. I wanted to emphasize race consciousness. It had a uh, platform, political, economic, and social blanks protest, self-reliance, self-sufficiency. It also included as a central and novel idea the founding of a Negro state, not in Africa as Garvey would have done, but in the US as an outlet for racial e egoism. It was a plan for harnessing of Negro energies for economic, political, and spiritual self-help. That was very innovative. A few years later, the Communist Party would come out with a similar proposal, but the Communist Party advocated having that nation in the South Harrison advocated having it out west. Next slide. Um, Harrison in 24 and 25, he uh, goes on the Midwest tour. Uh, that's when he, he challenges the Klan, but he's also campaigning uh, at first for the La, La Follette movement and others. He comes back to New York. It's a very difficult year for him. He's not in good health, and, but he continues his um, education lectures. And then I get into his, some of his relations with Amy Ashwood Garvey, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, and Augusta Savage, the leading black sculptress and art, really artist of that period, who he tries to help uh, get, you know, get her 
some backing here. She, she wins opportunities to go to Europe, but doesn't have the funding. And uh, also I discuss his work on the founding committee of the New York Public Library Negro Collection, uh, which grew into the Schomburg Center, although he's not mentioned as much as he should in that history. Next slide. In 1926, he writes on the Lafayette Theater Strike, a major struggle in Harlem. Uh, he writes uh, very important reviews of Nigger Heaven by Carl Van Becken. He's very critical of that, of course. He offers more on Garvey's divorce trial, and uh, he writes um, to Michael Gold and the New Masses and gets published, and he writes a book review on witchcraft. Next slide. Very interestingly, in this period, he delivers twice series of race of uh, lectures on world problems of race. The first one began July 8th to September 9th, 1926. There were 10 lectures. Next slide. I, I don't know if you can see it so well, but I'm going to read to you what the topics were. This is what he, he, he did. He, uh, the rise of the modern idea of race. And, he breaks that down into about four categories. The expansion and dominance of Europeans, the black man's burden in Africa, race problems in America, India and the British Empire, China and the powers, Japan, the Frankenstein of European imperialism, the revolt of Islam, culture and religious aspects of race, and the nemesis of white imperialism. And at the end, his little epilogue, Caliban considers. Next slide. Here's a picture of Harrison delivering that series of talks in, um, uh, this is uh, in 1926 on September 9th. And I'll just point out, I think I counted 78 people in this audience. They are all, as his children pointed out to me, he said, Jeff, they are working class people. They would get the men would put on jackets and ties and the women's, women would get dressed up. And they went out to these evening sessions, but that's not what they would wear during the day for work usually, <laughs> almost exclusively not. Uh, but on the far left, holding a book in his hands is Richard B. Moore. In the front row with something, I believe it's also a book on his lap is W.A. Domingo. And there's a host of other people in there. I believe Liliana Jonesboro, Hermie Weisswood, and I really want to try and get this photo up in as clear a uh, way as I can to see if others, maybe descendants of some of these people, can help identify some of the people. Let's go on. We just have a few more slides. Okay, um, in January to April of 27, he writes for the Pittsburgh Courier and he begins the publication, The Embryo of the Voice of the Negro, and then he begins his last publication, The Voice of the Negro. Next slide. He has the voice of the Negro, and he talks about uh, Harlem's first, you know, he talks that the first issue comes out in February, then the next issue comes, we'll go to the next slide. That's the embryo of the voice of the Negro, then comes the voice of the Negro, and then that's in April, then the next one is the voice of the Negro. Uh, the next issue, I believe, is May, and he's got interesting topics, short pieces, and then the next slide. Um, his diary and social activities. Jay Rogers writes to him from Paris. Um, when he dies, there are a number of fascinating obituaries, including uh, How the Great Die Young about Harrison and uh, obituaries and tributes. His, uh, his funeral was attended by over a thousand and uh, Schomburg delivered the eulogy, if you, next slide first. When he dies, one of the papers, I think this is the uh, New York News, possibly uh, Black uh, Weekly, has a picture of Harrison and his death, Harlem, sorrow, racist loss, next slide. And next slide is, um, I quote Arthur Schomburg from Harrison's uh, funeral, he delivered the eulogy and he says that Harrison was ahead of his time and just to review for people, Hubert Harrison understood white supremacy to be central to capitalist rule. He emphasized that those desiring significant changes 
would have to struggle against it to succeed. He emphasized that black people should develop race consciousness as a means, as both a measure of self-defense and as a key strategic component in that struggle. <laughs> he understood that in the US, African-Americans are the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. He understood that while the color line exists, the cant of democracy, the chant, is intended as dust in the eyes of white voters and used in wartime to mask what he called sordid imperialist aims. And he understood that true democracy and equality for African-Americans implies a revolution startling to even think of. And that's two slides, I think. Oh wait, less three slides, that's four slides. So Harrison, brilliant intellectual, race and class conscious, radical internationalist, centrality of the fight against white supremacy to social change. Next slide. Politically, the Negro is the touchstone, please remember this. And true democracy and equality implies a revolution startling to even think of. Next slide. Uh, this is in 1911 outside the Schomburg Center. That's Harrison's granddaughter on the right in the picture, uh, Ilva. That's Dr. Yosef Menyakinen, uh, who's a big follower of Harrison. Go back for a second. Issa Anade, who used to come to a lot of the talks we did on Harrison. And I'm on the left. And we were uh, getting petitions to have 134th Street and, um, uh, and uh, Adam Clayton, no, and uh, Lennox, 134th Street and Lennox, perhaps, <laughs> I forget, uh, named uh, Hubert Harrison Way after Hubert Harrison. And we got the number of significant uh, signatures and it was passed unanimously um, uh, at Community Board 10 but it has never been moved on. Uh, so maybe someday people will move on that. And then the next slide is uh, when he, in volume one, when Harrison first died, his grave site was unmarked and it remained that way until uh, 2013 or 14, when we got petitioned to get a uh, grave marker there. And then Ilva, whose picture I just showed you, stepped forward. She said she, she would like to pay for it. And she placed that marker on Harrison. It's a very beautiful marker. It's up at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, which has a large African-American collection. And I also have another slide, which I don't have here, but now in the Museum of Afro-American History in Washington, DC, on the wall on the new Negro, there are two photos or two pictures. One is Alain Locke and one is Hubert Harrison. So he's beginning to get his place in history, but that's it for now. And thank you for your patience. All right.